So for tonight's presentation, uh, we're going to uh, have Lee Johnson speak to us. Lee is, um, he's been a ham for a number of years. Uh, he got his license back in 1954 at the age of, sorry, 1957 at the age of 14. Uh, he was out in Hawaii, made a boatload of contacts because everybody wanted to speak to people in, in Hawaii. Um, he uh, has since retired, you know, well, he worked for uh, GTE, he worked for ITT, uh, for GTE, he was the uh, technology officer, chief technology officer. Um, I don't know what you do for IT. Uh, worked for Atlanta Scientific. Um, he has since retired and is living now in Marietta with his wife, uh, Deanne. Uh, his hobbies include uh, homebrew and, and tennis. And um, he is a club member. And he's going to talk to us about nano VNAs. Uh, they're uh, pretty cool devices. They can do a lot for the ham radio community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lee. Okay. Please welcome Lee Johnson. Thank you. I'm a member as of uh, one year ago, so it's my anniversary. Uh, Even better. Thirty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget. Um, that. We need the out lights, outside lights back on. You know I didn't need my nose, right? I don't know. <laughs> That's all right. Um, okay. Uh, what I'd like to do, I, I, I got into this because um, Jim Stafford, about uh, six months ago, said, have you seen one of these things? And I said, no. Well, he got me hooked into it, and so, it, as a number of you have probably been down the same path uh, with Jim, uh, it was like, okay, this is an interesting uh, problem to solve, because a lot of us have gone through the uh, software-defined radios, little dongles, and all that stuff, and you see the technology and, and what you can do. And what I thought I'd do is share the last few months of my learning curve uh, with the club as, uh, as a way to help uh, contribute to the club. Um, so I'll give you a little background uh, on, uh, let's see, you gave me the machine here. Is it obvious how I operate it? Okay, good. Well, okay. Good to go to the right, there you go. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I, my, my dad was in the service, so we, he put uh, his whole career, his choice of assignment, Hawaii, 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 all three times. And after 27 years, he got Hawaii. So I go to high school in Hawaii. It was kind of a nice place to go to high school. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the time frame, it was Sunspot 19. Okay? That was one. You guys weren't around that one. You could work anybody on any band with any amount of power. It was a mess, especially in Hawaii. My folks complained about the uh, postage uh, amount of spending more than anything else. Uh, so as a result of, of getting into a high school ham club, building a, an oscillator, getting my license in Hawaii, and getting started with electronics when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15, uh, built a, for those of you who know the Heathkit company, Heathkit uh, Apache transmitter, I'm 13 years old building a Heathkit Apache transmitter, and I've never touched a soldering iron in my life. And it worked the first time. So I thought, okay, wow. maybe there's hope for me. And uh, the receiver I had was an old Helicrafters SX-28A. And for those of you who don't know that receiver, that, uh, that was probably one of the better ones around. It's a long, old, old-time receiver. Uh, the only picture I could find on the internet, uh, I was thinking about putting it in here, was on Harry Truman's desk. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking, that was a brand new receiver in that time frame. But uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, in the same league as the old uh, R390s uh, in terms of what they did at the time. Uh, also, uh, when I went to work after being in the service for a while, uh, joined the Raleigh uh, Ham community. And we said, look, why don't we start a ham club? And we started uh, the Roars Club in uh, 1969. I'm one of the charter members there. 
and it's the largest club in North Carolina. And uh, I was looking to see what the membership was, and they said over 300. Well, you know what that means, right? <laughs> so it, it's somewhere around there, but uh, it's, it's been a pretty good club. The, uh, the 0464 machine, uh, I built that, installed it, maintained it, and put the antenna up at about 275 feet um, on one of the Altel towers. And I had a strange feeling one afternoon before my kids were born, putting an antenna up, I realized I had both hands off the tower. And for those of you who've been on a tower, you know what that feels like. But at 200, over 200 feet, it feels pretty bad. But anyway, that machine, uh, it, it was because of uh, Mackie Radio, or McKay Radio, for some of you who know that name, it's a shipboard radio product. It was part of ITT, which is a company I was working for at the time. So we, I had modules, I had stuff available. Uh, the Aerotron company was there, so we had guys who knew how to do strip line, two meter ample, 50 watt amplifiers, not a big deal. We made a club project out of that in the uh, uh, early 70s. Uh, and so I, that kind of got me into the high tech industry, and I've been in the high tech industry for 40 years and finally retired. Uh, we live in Marietta. Uh, we've, the uh, first 20 years of my life, I worked in uh, Raleigh at ITT. And, after deregulation of a telecom industry, it's like, okay, we're all looking for jobs. And so we started moving a little bit. So the uh, uh, second half of my career is uh, not with uh, one company, as you might expect. A lot of us had, had to go through deregulation and uh, got bounced around a little bit. So it was kind of an interesting uh, exercise. Um, in the last few years, I've got up on HF, um, not much VHF, going through the software to find radios. Uh, the real problem I had with that was I had an old, uh, the airborne version of the R, the Navy version of the R390. I thought, okay, I've got a 10 year old grandson, his birthday's coming up, I'll just take it up to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where they live, and I'll get him started in the ham radio. So I get it out of a cardboard box and turn it on, and smoke comes out. <laughs> I'm already committed, and it's like, now what do I do? And so I go, okay, I can fix this thing. I'm a double A, so I can fix this thing, right? Well, getting a 400 volt cap capacitor for power supply. Those stores don't exist anymore. You can buy them from China. If you want a diode, power power supply diode, you can get what you need, but you need a hundred of them. You buy a hundred of them. So it's like, okay. So I'm going through this thing and I'm realizing I'm running out of time. And I thought, okay, I, I saw something about a software defined radio and that seems like a reasonable thing to do. And my 10 year old grandson can handle a Mac computer, so I'm going, got a solution. But that just gives you a sense of, of how far the technology has come in, in most of our lives in the, in the career, or in, in not in the career, but in, the, in ham radio itself. It's come a long way in the last 20 or 30 years. But I, I want to give you an insight tonight as to how far it's come on a different flank, but it's got the same driving forces behind it. I've uh, been playing with uh, putting antennas up. Uh, I'm on the board of the HOA, and Everybody said, don't tell anybody. And I tried to put one in the backyard. I'll show it to you in a minute. But this, it got me into saying, all right, how do I tune this thing? How do I get it right? I'm, we're hiding in the tree, so it's a matter of how do we, how do we deal with it? Um, and so this whole thing flows. I'll, I'll, the outline is kind of like this. Um, where did the nano NBA come from? How I got mine? what happened with it, what the specs are, a little bit about that. Go into the architecture, and I'll, I'll keep it kind of light because it, it, you can drill down pretty far with uh, some of the uh, DSP algorithms and things like that. It's just not worth the, the time unless you want to go through a Smith chart with a micro, microscope. Um, a little bit about the operation, some application examples, and a Q&A thing on the end. There is a test, by the way. <laughs> there is a test. Once, I got one slide that I think maybe as a result of some of the presentation and discussions, you'll be able to recognize what type of antenna it is by what the slide looks like on this VNA. You'll be surprised if you haven't been involved with the, with the, uh, the new nano DNAs, you'll be surprised at what it can do. Some of you, I'm sure, have your own, your own uh, for 50 bucks, a lot of us just kind of threw money at it to see what was going to happen, and I was quite, quite surprised. Uh, there's my house and there's the antennas. The only antennas I can put up, one in the attic, just a 40 meter dipole to get started. 
And this is a re last few years venture for me, getting back on the air. And then there's the off-center fed uh, 80 uh, through 10 uh, dipole in the back. It's up about 65 feet now. Uh, and then I learned how to use a slingshot again. I almost took out one of my Palladian windows with it, but uh, I got it up in the air anyway. I, and then I started thinking, this is before I got into this uh, vegan night, what's the pattern look like and how do I know which antennas, which, and now I got 40 meter antennas, a dipole and the off-center fed dipole, and I thought I'd just switch between the two and see what happened. And so, uh, this is a, uh, uh, the blue one is a 40 meter dipole in the attic, and the red one is the orientation of the off-center fed dipole, uh, that being the short leg. Uh, and the dipole, uh, 40 meter dipole did a lot better out in this direction, about 10 dB better. Now, what I was doing was just going through looking at azimuth of, you know, from you know, where's their station, what's the azimuth, and, and what kind of signal strength. And I finally decided, okay, it's got to be 10 dB or 2S units, otherwise it doesn't matter. So it's just to try to do a top-down version of, you know, where the signals might be coming from. And so this is a, a better spot for the 40 meter dipole, and that's a better spot for the off-center fed, as you might expect from that V pointing in that direction. <coughs> and then I thought, okay. Went to the ham fest. I thought, I'm, I need an analyzer, right? Because I'm trying to tune these antennas, and I've got a 7300. I don't want to burn it up. So I'm a little bit careful about that. Um, and I looked at the price, and I'm going, I don't think I want to put that kind of money in it. The antennas are working fine. And so I didn't, uh, I didn't buy it, but I did use the club uh, a 259 analyzer, uh, MFJ version, yeah. and I got it tuned up and everything. And I thought, okay, this is a rather difficult process, and there must be a better way to do this. And then I talked to Jim, and sure enough, we got uh, we got into the geek toy of the year. Uh, it's this is what uh, what they look like on. Uh, Amazon. And if you do an Amazon page, you'll find that there's about 60 of them <laughs> for sale. The prices go from $3,500 if you want to buy a thousand of them or so, to 25 bucks. I saw one for 15 bucks the other day. <laughs> and it's like, okay, they're all coming from China. I'll, I'll, I'll get into this a little, little bit. But um, basically, You'll notice it's got two ports on it as opposed to a single port. So you can do a lot more with, with this analyzer than you can with the other analyzers that we're all used to. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more. It's basically an RF multimeter. It's, it's not just a single port. What's the SWR? Uh, it'll give you uh, basically, notice the name is Vector Network Analyzer. It gives you, um, a real component of the signal and the reactive component of the signal. So it gives you an idea of what the vector, that's where the term comes from, that points towards the impedance angles or whatever on the Smith chart. But it gives you an idea of a lot more than you might expect from just, um, well, the problem is if you're running an RF, it's, it's like running a, at, at light. It, it's, a, it's a wave wave kind of problem. You have reflections, you have impacts of other things. And so, well, you'd think I'd know how to operate this thing. The state of the art is $50,000 for one of these things. Okay. And if you look at, and that, those machines are probably been in the industry for like, um, I'd say, 30 years or so. And uh, some of the, uh, the ham clubs have, have built the, the smaller ones, but you need a computer to run them. And so for 50 bucks, you can do functionally the same thing as most of those machines. You can put it a different way. You can do the things you want to do with your antennas and with your, let's say your, your, your new uh, power amplifiers, you want to tune the filters. You can do that with these things. So you can do a lot more than you might expect for 50 bucks.
I got mine on Amazon and paid a few bucks more just to make sure I didn't have a China problem. And uh, I ended up with, uh, it cost me 72 bucks. And that's what it looks like on the bottom. I took the cover off of it. Uh, and the interesting thing is if you look at it, it's basically uh, the mainline device is characterized by shields on the RF side of the printed circuit board and a battery. Some of them come without batteries, and the reason is lithium batteries and shipping don't always, some country can't do that. So that's why some of them don't have batteries. It's not because they're too cheap to put them in there, it's just that they can't ship them. Uh, and the other one is the shielding on the RF side, so you don't have the impact of, uh, of uh, uh, external sources. The interesting thing, if you look at it, it's, it's basically two printed circuit boards stacked on each other with standoffs, and that's it. There's no case on them. The case that uh, you can see that there's a standoffs. Uh, there's a rocker switch going back and forth and back and forth and up and down. So it's a little complicated to operate, especially if you're having uh, finger troubles. Uh, power switch and the USB port, and then the uh, network ports. So that's what that looks like. Uh, a little background historically that might be helpful in understanding where this stuff came from. The interesting thing is it's an open source project, both software and hardware. Okay? And what happened was uh, uh, a Chinese ham called Eddie 555 uh, basically published in uh, 2016 um, on GitHub both the open source uh, hardware design uh, and the firmware or software. So it's out there, and what happened was a second guy jumped in, worked with Eddie 555, took his design, and commercialized it. Okay, so a lot of what you see now being, being bought, this was a kit form, this is a product. Okay, and this kit form came, this kit came out of a, uh, uh, a German kit that was done in the uh, 2007 time frame. Okay, so the idea was you got a processor, uh, you, can, you can get the firmware out there pretty easy, you got the devices to be able to do it when you didn't really have it before, you can put the process, you don't need an external computer. So all of a sudden this thing started coming around and saying, okay, we can build something that's pretty economical that uh, a lot of hands would like to have. Uh, by the way, GitHub, uh, I don't know if most of you are familiar with GitHub, but it's an open source repository. Uh, it turns out my daughter-in-law is a lawyer for GitHub. Turns out. Is she now a lawyer for Microsoft? I'm sorry? Is she now a lawyer for Microsoft? No. Nope, since nope. they bought GitHub? Nope. nope. <laughs> That's why she left, as a matter of fact. She's one of these privacy lawyers that uh, is part of the Google uh, activity going on right now. Oh, she's going to be busy for years to come. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so anyway, the Chinese figured out we can clone this thing. The design's free. Let's go do it. So that's why it's a fifty dollar device. There's a lot of Chinese making this thing. It's available, and uh, they're actually pretty good. If you get the right one, if you get the wrong one, you're SOL. <laughs> uh, but and product extensions are being developed by basically. This guy's driving a lot of them. Part of the problem is the software and hardware sometimes split. And so you, you, you don't know, since it's open source, you're not sure exactly which hardware platform or software platform you're running on. So I guess buyer beware is one thing I would at least mention. Be careful where you source it from, okay? Um, they're going to four inch screens, uh, they're going to three gigahertz, and probably gonna go to six. So if you look at 900 megahertz, it covers most everything we wanted to cover anyway in the first generation. The firmware does what you need, so you don't have to wait for some of this stuff. And, if, and these screens are big enough to work with. I, I'm 70, 80, and I can, I can see the screen okay, it's not that, not that bad. Uh, and you'll see some of the screens will pop up here in a minute. Uh, and then they're also doing things with uh, time domain reflectometers. When I put my uh, 
uh, all center fed dipole on the ballon failed on the 40 meter leg side of the antenna. This would have shown that. I had to take the thing down to find out that that's what happened. And also there's third party software being available. If you wanted, for, for instance, this device will hold the data as long as it's powered up. You turn it off, data's gone. So if you want a record of what you've done or how, or, or you want to publish something, you want to do something that's a bit more permanent, you need external connection on a USB port <coughs> and some external software, but that, that stuff is also open source and, and available. So it's not that difficult to get. But you don't need it for most of what you're probably going to use the device for. Uh, this is a little more chronology, but uh, I think uh, just a couple of highlights. One is Hewen's uh, product is a black BNA with uh, shields on channel one and channel zero. <coughs> that's that's the core of what you want to make sure you get your hands on is those shields. Um, there's the H model and there's an F model coming out, and that that is the um, one of them is a screen size, and the other one is uh, extending the uh, frequency range. And there's a version two of the devices coming from both those sources that are in development that are going to push the envelope with regard to how far you want to go up in, uh, in frequency. Uh, this is an interesting group here. This is the, for those of you who came from Yahoo Groups, uh, you're probably now on Groups.io. Uh, you can get emails from these guys more than you want. You can see the, you can see the detail of what's rolling in the front there on the daily emails if you really want to do it. Uh, there's what it looks like the main page. Uh, there's about 4,000 members. Uh, it's split up into some of those areas, but there's the, there's the top hashtags, and if you get into this is the uh, nano users group and files, and this is a, a, a wiki that gives you a lot more detail. And it's running; it runs real time, pretty much. You see, you see, you see the turmoil, and you see the good and the bad uh, coming along there. Uh, and this group really runs pretty well, from what I've seen so far. Uh, specs goes to 900 megahertz. The RF output is about a tenth of a milliwatt. Not a lot, but you can stick it on the antenna and see it on your other antenna. It's out there. It's rock solid. Uh, it's it's pretty good on frequency, uh, as you might expect, being on on channel, if you will. Um, dynamic range is good enough to make the measurements you really need to do to get up here. What the, one of the extensions they made was the first part came out up to 300 megahertz, and one of the extensions they made was say, look, let's just use the harmonics. We've got a digital signal processor in here anyway. We can go to 900 megahertz with the second and third harmonic. So that's what they've done with it. But the dynamic range you can see in the first 300 megahertz is a lot better than it is up here. But you know, 50 dB dynamic range at, at almost a gigahertz, not bad. <coughs> Smaller screen. Uh, quality of the screen is really pretty good though. Uh, USB, both power and uh, data. Uh, Decent battery. Uh, I run mine for outside for about two and a half hours. So it's, it gives you enough battery to work with. Uh, one problem that you run into here is that it only plots 100 points. Well, 100 points is okay unless you're looking at an 80 meter dipole and you got the scale set at 0 to 900 megahertz. <laughs> you might have missed the whole band. Okay, so that's one of the problems, but for the most part, uh, if you're working an 80-meter dipole problem, or if you will, multi-band, you're still going to be in you know one to 30 megahertz range, and that's that's plenty of bandwidth uh, uh, or or precision. And you'll see from some of the charts we'll put up there. Uh, but that problem is solved by the external software, where you can take that 100 points and get you a thousand points and and get a lot more precision with regard to the plots and Smith charts and things like that. You get four traces, four markers to go along with it, and you can move the markers around, uh, and then five memory locations for calibration. The calibration is a large part of what you see on all the, the uh, websites, because you're running very different frequency spreads 
and you need to calibrate precisely if you really want a good set of measurements. So, and, and one of the problems you'll find is that uh, uh, you got a, these are uh, SMA connectors, they're small connectors, uh, and if you're going to calibrate every time you change bands or change, uh, every time you turn the device on, uh, once you get the setup for what bandwidth you're going to run uh, the, the plots on, you'll need to calibrate it. So you're sitting there putting the calibrate, you know, the opens and the, and the shorts and the 50 ohm load on there sequentially. Well, that SMA connector for a 50 buck device, you're going to lose that gold after you do that a few times. So most of us have put extensions on there not to, you know, destroy those connectors. Uh, that's uh, pretty pretty stable. And basically, it's a vector network analog with two ports. And you, we'll start talking about S parameters a little bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll try not to get too deep uh, into it. Uh, there's a block diagram and uh, clock generator, as you might expect. Uh, there's the bridge coming off the uh, uh, channel zero port, channel one port, and then there's the mixers, and then you get the uh, codec. This uh, I2S is the codecs that are used for um, any digital music, digital encoding, and digital decoding kind of, uh, of audio. That's the standard that they use for that, and so they just locked onto that set of hardware and software. And then there's the processor, and it's got enough memory to, to do something. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's what it looks like. There's a the schematic, mm -hmm. and more things you'll find in the clones, the schematics are all the same. <laughs> and, and the design is stable enough that most of them work, if they're working, most of them are working pretty well. So the, the core, that's the core platform, and that's, that's the Eddy 555 schematic. <clears throat> and it's been moved around a little bit, but it's, it's the core platform that they're running on. Uh, okay, how to use it. This is, <coughs> this is the device, and there's a case right there. I'll, I'll have a case on mine. I'll show you the device in a minute. But basically, you see the menu display pop up, and there's different levels of menu. And uh, once you get used to it, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, and I'll show you what, the, what it looks like. This is a curve of SWR. By the way, that's one to one, two to one, three to one, okay? Just to give you an idea. So this, this goes from six megahertz to eight megahertz. And I think this is my 40 meter dipole. So that's right there, and that's uh, 7.5 right there. But just to give you an idea, there's a best SWR of, of two, two right there. Okay, so I got it lined up pretty well in the van, and uh, and that's there's the Smith chart in the background. You see the curves, and that gives you an idea of what the uh, impedance is. And you'll see that, uh, for instance, this is covered up a little bit, but but basically. You want to stay in the center of the Smith chart. That's where you get the low SWRs. You get, I guess, maybe the way to think about it is, since some of you know a Smith chart and some of you don't, it's, it's a chart that was done, I think, in the 60s or 50s for microwave engineering. And the idea is to be able to do strip design and be able to handle microwave frequencies with dimensions uh, and then be able to... Uh, and or complex impedances over frequency range because it changes over frequency. That's the big problem that they started to try to solve with Smith, Smith charts. But the center of that chart is 50 ohms. That line right there in the middle of Smith chart goes from zero to 50 ohms to infinity. Okay, and if it's a reactive component like a capacitive reactants or an inductive reactants, then it goes off this linear uh, line of, of just pure resistance and goes into the reactive domain. Okay, and so this is a plot of uh, what the impedance is looking at the antenna over the frequency range of six. There's a, that point right there, you know, you'll notice 
it, it actually does line up there. Those are the same ones. It's not the same frequency, but I, I'm sorry. It's not the same point in the graph, but it's the same frequency at uh, 7.14. Okay? And so that's why it fits the <laughs> And that's the resonant point in the antenna. And so that's, that's what you'll see with these curved lines in Smith charts. You want to stay in the middle of Smith chart, close to, close to 50 ohms, as opposed to getting out here, where your SWRs are you know, 20 or 30 or 40. And that's about all we need to do in a Smith chart, I think. But it's a, it's a useful notion uh, to get to uh, have some understanding. This is a menu tree options. This is just a partial tree. And if you look at the chart we had before, it had display, marker, and then two or three more at the first level of menu structure. And then they go down to, there's the four traces, and you'll see the different colors on the, on the device as we get into it. And then this one is, uh, there's, there's the real chart. Okay? And, uh, but if you think about it, you got the display, the, home, the high level of menu, traces, and you got the different color traces you can put on and off or whatever plot you want. Either return loss, um, SWR, um, time domain reflectometer, Smith charts, whatever you want to do. And then you got in some of these other things you go to, like stimulus, for instance. Okay? You'll put that on a the marker. There we go, start. If you want to do, let's say, a 40 meter dipole, you might want to do 6 to 8 megahertz to start with. Because you may be off, you may not know where you are. So you start at, say, 6 megahertz, go to 8 megahertz, and uh, on a numeric pad, and, and you're off and running. But basically, that's the whole, the whole plot. This is what it looks like when you first fire it up and you go, oh my god, I got a bad unit from China. That was my first thought when I saw that chart. Okay. Let's roll through this here a little bit. What's the QR um, code for? I'm sorry? What's the QR code for? Is that the help file? <laughs> uh, I think it's just a I don't know. We can find scan out. it yeah. Scan yeah. it and find out. It's their website uh, QR. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it takes you to their website. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th there is there is a um, I don't know how many of you know uh, Dave, uh, what's his last name? The guy who's on the internet all over the place, ham radio, Kessler. 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 Dave Kessler. About a month ago, he was on, and I was listening to one of his podcasts, and he said he was going to do a presentation on the, the uh, network uh, uh, vector analyzer. And he said, but I just haven't had time. He said, it looks pretty complicated, I'm, and I don't know how to get through it quickly. And I had just seen this document uh, by this guy right here. Okay, he's January 13th was his latest version. He's, he's updates it about every 10 days. This is the best document out there with regard by this guy right here. Uh, it's the best document out there on this device. So if you want to start with taking a look at it, this is a manual that you want to know about. It's the best one out there. It's accurate, and it gives you a lot of history. But it tells you, for instance, calibration is a black art on this thing until you read this. And it takes it down to, here's how you do it, and here's why you do it that way. Okay, so I'd, I'd recommend that. And it's broken up into what's the device all about, standalone operation, and then operation with a PC. And, and the uh, Nano VNA Saver uh, version 2 uh, is probably one of the more popular ones. Okay, uh, S parameters. Uh, you might wonder what an S parameter is and why you care. Uh, this comes from the optic world early on, and it's, it's a scattering parameter. So if you look at the impedance going in, you know, if you take a lens, you got some reflected energy. Sounds like SWR, right? You start to talk about what that looks like in return laws and things like that. And some of it gets all the way through. So if you have a four-port device, you can actually, um, uh, a two-port device like we have here, uh, you can actually measure the, the impedance going in, uh, get a sense of what the impedance match is there and what the reflected power looks like, and start to look at what SWR looks like. 
And you can also take, for instance, the bandpass filter for a linear and uh, solid state linear if you're building one. You'd like to make sure that filter is okay. You can actually put the signal in here and look at the signal over here and get a very good idea of what the frequency response is and what the impedance looks like uh, from the device. But uh, S11 is looking in there and seeing what you got, what the impedance looks like going in. And then S12 uh, gives you an idea uh, across the device from the one port to the other port. So a lot of the strength of this device is as a result of having those two ports and being able to do not just a reflective measurement, but a through measurement as well. So you can look at a lot of devices that you couldn't look at before. Uh, as an example, if you take it, uh, and like I said, it was kind of a multimeter, you can actually do the SWR measurements, complex load impedances, you can look at power splitters and diplexers, you can look at the return loss of a filter, uh, get an idea of what the return loss of an amplifier going in, and then cable impedance as well. Okay, that's that's on the uh, looking in the, the primary port, and this is this is the port that you see on most uh, uh, simple analogs as well. You can start to do some of those things, but you can't do those because you don't have the second port. You can't look at an amplifier gain response. You can't look at a filter. You can't look at a ballon. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit. One of the plots I've got here is a 88 to 108 band stop. So if you're running an SDR and you're overloaded by an FM station, you're going to put one of those filters in there. And I just use that as an example of, of how to look at the S21 a through measurement. Did I hit the right button? No. Okay. Here, here's the SWR plots of the, uh, uh, of the uh, off center fed dipole. And I don't know how many of you have seen that kind of a plot before. But that, this is SWR, right there. One to one's down here. Two is right there. Three, four. You can change the scale if you want to. But this gives you an idea of, if you look at that frequency right there, there's 80 meters and there's 40. Okay? And you, so you can start to see pretty quickly, because this goes from 1 megahertz to 30 megahertz. And you can set the scale wherever you want to. So if you want to look deeper into it, you can say, okay, what's the 80 meter piece look like? So you take it, you go from three and a half to four and a half. And you see it's a pretty broad resonance point. It's not real sharp like you'd expect from a, a, single, L, a single frequency dipole. So the Q is not quite as high. But it stays basically uh, two to one from, you know, pretty low in the band so almost, uh, let's see, that's, uh, that's probably uh, certainly off the top end of the band. So it's, it's pretty usable there. Uh, and here's the, the 40 meter version. But, well, I, I just took that right there and then made a chart saying, all right, go from six to eight megahertz and what's it look like? Okay, and here's uh, 20 meters. Okay, that's, that's 13.5 to uh, 20 megahertz. Okay, so it gives you some. There's there's 20 meters right there. That that is uh, 14215 as you can see up there. So all of a sudden you got a lot of data on just a few charts about your antenna. And that was an antenna I bought. Uh, it's uh, from Ham Radio and worked out pretty well for me. Uh, and then if you look at the uh, dipole. Single band dipole. You see the it's a lot sharper, and there's the there's the seven megahertz. There's seven point two three eight, and that's almost one. It's it's a one point. What is that? I can't see it. One point. Five. Yeah, I think so. It's not one point five, but it's good. It, yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty low. But anyway. And I, I, I plotted both the fundamental and the third, just to give you an idea of, you know, there's a third sitting at, uh, uh, let's see, why is it 14? That can't be the second. I always have the marker in the wrong place. In any case, basically, if that's 30 megahertz, there's 15 meters. And in Hawaii, 
I had a 40 meter dipole up on a mountain almost, and so 15 meters was a nice way to operate with that 40 meter antenna. And on cycle 19, you could, it didn't matter. Uh, you could use it that way. Here's the Smith chart. So it shows you the SWR, all right, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. Okay, so there you are at uh, 7.4 here. So that's, that's 2 to 1. And there's uh, right at 7 megahertz. And uh, that's uh, uh, right in, you know, decent in the middle of the band. <laughs> so it gives you a much sharper idea of what the resonant point looks like. And you can see here's the, what the Smith chart looks like. This is, again, it's 50 ohms resistive. And so it's not too far off being in the middle of a Smith chart, so you got some idea of what you're working with. So all of a sudden, you, you take these things and you start to realize, you know, you can play with this antenna a lot if you want to. Uh, here's a, an application of taking a, a filter or an amplifier and seeing what you got to work with. This, this is my unit, and this is the band pass, the, the violet color. Okay, so you see, see the band stop right there at uh, 88 to 108 right there. It just knocks it out completely. And uh, this, this is in fact the uh, uh, return loss across that. So you get some idea of return loss and SWR are, are similar notions. Uh, return loss is if you, if you send a signal in and you got a re return, what's the loss of that return? It's a simple me mechanism, and it's measured in dB. So that's, that's what that curve really is right there, if, which is the same curve here. All right, and it's a log, uh, a, a log magnitude curve, 10 dB. So it's uh, basically, uh, return loss of there is pretty bad, and it gets better down here, and that's just the opposite way for SWR. I didn't plot that. Here's the Smith chart curve uh, of that, and you see the same fundamental pieces of it overlaid on a Smith chart. Again, it, some of that doesn't make a lot of sense, but I thought I'd throw it up as a capability you can actually run the overlays of the different uh, charts. Uh, you can also take, uh, you can make an antenna range out of this thing. You can basically take a piece of coax, set it up, back away from your antenna, get out of the near field, and rotate the antenna and uh, basically see what you got. Because you got two ports, you got a transmitter and you got a receiver. And you can fire the transmitter up through the antenna, go out, out outside the near field and just do a rotation and there you are. Kind of hard to do at 40 meters, but you can certainly do it. <laughs> so there's another, there's another application of it. You can't do that with a single port analyzer, as an example. Uh, time domain reflectometer. You can actually take uh, and, and see impedance and distance on the screens. For instance, uh, if you look at this one right here, you'll, you may remember that's the, the, that's the resistive line on, on a Smith chart. So that's all, that's pure resistance. And it, it gives you a sense of, if you look at, <coughs> let's see, if you look at this one, you got a, uh, two of them, you got basically a 50 ohm piece of coax, a four foot section of 50 ohm, and you got a four foot section of 93 ohm coax. And you can see it jump up right here when it changes the impedance. Okay? And then also, it gives you a sense of uh, you can look at distance, and you can, <laughs> these charts are calibrated in meters, so you have to kind of go through that process. But, but you, can, you can actually see where. Um, you have an open or a short or something on your coax feed line and tell where it is. And as long as, long as, you, as long as you know the velocity factor. Okay. So this one, this one is basically two pieces of coax with the end left open. And so you can see what happens at the end of it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so uh, when I was in the Navy, we used time domain reflectometers to check the integrity of the cabling that we use for our instrumentation. And if we had any damage, nicks, kinks, whatever in that cabling, 
we could find out what it was by using these things. Right. Basically, it's a radar that you send through the cable. Wherever you, ever, wherever you have a change in impedance, that's where your damage is. And it saves a lot of time going to look for this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cable companies love those. Oh, sure. Does it allow you to change the frequency that you do your TDR at? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, you can change it to, you, basically the, the transmitters, it covers from 50 uh, kilohertz to 900 megahertz, and you can put it wherever you want to. Uh, this is some of the software that's becoming available for uh, external uh, use on the device. It's got a USB port. So you can hook it up, and, and this was probably the best one, and that's my recommendation there. Uh, but basically, it's you see it's on that group thing, again on the internet, uh, and you can you can get up on the internet and look at that. One of the things you find is that uh, see there's there's a guy who's doing part of his work. Uh, this one is not as well done as this one is by far. Uh, you can also do it on an Android if you want to instead of a, a PC. You can do it on a Mac but you need to go through Python to get there. And I just didn't have time to do that. So I, I opted out, you know, if, if anybody's interested in looking at what these software packages do on top of this, uh, I, I haven't found the need to do that yet. <laughs> okay? So I, I felt like leaving that part of the presentation with just this kind of an interface was probably a useful place to, to stop on that, on that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an example, here's here's the one I was telling you about. This is what the charts look like. There's the interface. There's the uh, the I/O. Fill in the blanks and do what you want to do. And basically, uh, it, it uses touchstone files, which are standard industry files for this kind of stuff. Okay. And uh, this guy here is is, is doing a, a real yeoman's job on this. Uh, and if you want to play with the software on top of these devices. This is the one I'd recommend you start with. But you know, as an example, the TDR, they're starting to spend a lot more time on doing some of that. Um, they're getting, uh, let's see, uh, some of this is just stuff. Uh, but a lot of it is uh, dealing with the fact that you've got a device, when you turn it off, it's all gone. At least this, you can store the data offline and do something with it. You get a permanent record. And it also has some capability that uh, of doing, uh, for instance, a thousand steps instead of a hundred steps. So you can use a much bigger screen and get a bit more fidelity uh, if you like. Uh, here, here's here's that device I showed you earlier. You see the chart it looks a bit looks kind of similar to the one I did before. Okay, recognize the curve of the band stop, and then the return loss on top of it. Okay, this is external software, and all it's really doing is presenting it in a way that you can store it, process it, and, uh, you know, do, do comparisons with. And then, let's see, uh, here's sources and links. This is probably the most useful part of this right here. All right, that's the, uh, the I.O. forum. And there's the user's part, uh, detail files, a wiki, and then also here's the group home, which is the page I showed you earlier. Uh, this is a good introduction video. I've probably looked at in the last three months at 200 <laughs> videos. That's probably the, the cleanest one I've seen in terms of, okay, if you got to pick one, which one would you like? Which, which, which one would give you the most information in some concise form that you can use? And so that's a good starting point. Uh, there's a software that uh, run did, and uh, then the, the Android again. Uh, okay, I told you there was a test. Yeah, I mean, let's do the test first. Uh, the, 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 this is the test of, of what you've learned, okay? I was going to put money on the table, but I thought maybe I shouldn't do that. Uh, this is a chart of an antenna. Uh, looking in a single port, and this is the SWR, okay? It goes from 50 kilohertz to 900 megahertz, and it's almost one to one, or less than two to one, I'm sorry, less than two to one, all the way across, except for a few little irregularities there, 
and the Smith charge right in the middle. So the impedance is staying close to 50 ohms as you run around it. Disc cone. Okay. Good. You got it. It's, it's a disc cone with a with a, with a uh, CB vertical on it. Okay. That's which is what that is. Okay. But but the notion of of what you can do with this chart, you know, backing into what kind of antenna you got it plugged into, it, it's that rich in terms of its information and what what you can do with it. Okay. Yeah, I, I just thought I'd do a quick look at this thing here and get it going. We probably have to turn it on, don't we? <laughs> well, that's interesting. If you, if you look at that, uh, there's, a, there's my device. There's a case I bought for it, by the way. And, uh, uh, but if you, if you look at the screen, uh, there's one of the, uh, there's that input right there. And if, let's see, what's the easiest way to do this? There's the first level of, can you zoom I'll try not to move it. I'm sorry. Can you zoom it There's a display. I can get it. Hmm? Uh, it has to play can zoom in. That's the screw thing. Uh, okay. There's display, marker, um, stimulus, calibrate, um, recall, save. So if you had set it up for, let's say, uh, up to 30 megahertz, you might want to use that again. Okay, and so you save that as one of your calibration points, and you don't have to do it again the next time you use it. If you're looking at two meters and 440, then you know you can set that one up, uh, and then you just close it. But but this is the menu I showed you before. Okay, and so if you can you can do it this way, or you can do it with this switch right here. If I can, I'm trying to do it without getting in the way of it. You can do it with this switch right here. There's a switch on top, which you may be able to see right here. And it's a crazy switch because it's, it's an up-down switch, but also if you go if third dimension to it, if you push the switch down, you might go up or down if you hit it wrong, or you might do something completely different. So I ended up using this. But basically, if you want to set up a particular, uh, you start with display, and you hit a trace, and uh, let me just pick out uh, the trace I'm going to use is the yellow one, okay? And I'm going to make that, uh, uh, let's see, let's, let's make it, uh, what format we want to use? Let's use SWR, okay? So we hit SWR, and then we say, okay, now for what frequency band do we want to operate on? Uh, and then we'll go to stimulus, and you start start this, since this is a, a, a 2 meter and 440 antenna, let's, let's start it at 200 megahertz. Okay, and then we'll go, we'll stop it at let's say 500 megahertz. And there's your, there's your SWR. Okay, and if you look at Part of the problem I got is that this table is affecting the, affecting it a bit. And that's, uh, but if I want to try to find out where that is, what frequency that is, I can just run the, uh, there it is. So that's uh, 300 and something megahertz, okay? This should be, well, I don't know what happened. I should have started at 100, not 200. Okay, there we go. Now there's, there's the, the, the two meter and 440 SWR curves. So you can see where it looks like. And if you want to look at, uh, for instance, uh, uh, return loss, or some other manifestation of that, you can hit the display and go to format and hit hit that. And that gives you a different curve. And that curve is basically, this is the zero line for that curve. And each one is 10 dB. You can see the scale up here. So 
that data point right there is 19 dB down. Okay? And if you're in this range, you know, if you're over 20 dB, you got a good SWR. Okay? You've seen the charts of re reflectivity, SWR, and um, return loss. And, uh, you know, if you got, you don't have a lot here. You only got about 14, 14 dB return loss there. So that's not great. So it's a better antenna up here as you might expect. But uh, if you look at the SWR, you can also look at the Smith chart and get a sense of where the, uh, the resonant points are. We'll add that on top of it. Format. I mean, I better, I better pick the trace first. Okay, here's the trace. And there's, there's what the, uh, what you find on a Smith chart is, if, if you're in the middle, you're close to resonance. If you're out here, the SWR is going out in a hurry. Okay, so there's a resonant point there. That, that point is almost resonant. And if you move that down to there, it would move right in the middle at the 50 ohm point with no reactive component to the uh, imaginary part of the uh, uh, impedance. Oh, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, but, and you can also get a feel for, uh, let's turn this trace off. Okay. You can get a feel for what happens as you touch the antenna. You can see it, you can see it's not quite as sharp at some of the uh, resonant points as you might expect. Um, my, my point in doing this is just to give you a sense of how interactive it is. Uh, and the nice thing about it is you can do this on a ladder outside in the yard. Okay? You don't need to take a PC out there. Um, and it's small enough. My battery will, will go, f I, I used one for, I've had a couple of long runs on it. One of them was about two and a half hours long. So it's a big enough battery to do what you want to outside with it. And it's 50 bucks and if you blow it up because you turn the transmitter on, then, you know, you didn't, you didn't throw a lot of money away. But it's an amazing device, and I thought, okay, it's worthwhile bringing it up and giving you an insight as to what it looks like. Uh, so, uh, any questions? <laughs> Pick one. Yes, if I want to buy one on Amazon, what do I order? Ah, would you pull up that slide that I said uh, we might need? Oh, good. Uh, my, my, let me tell you what that is. That, that's a website that's, as near as I can tell, it's got the latest battery. It's got a larger battery than the one I've got. Uh, it, it's it's a, a Hugen's uh, design. Okay, it's the H model. That stands for Hugen, uh, the second, uh, the guy who, who productized it in the first place. So you're getting the primary designer if you get the H model. Okay, it's a wild west out there, and I'm not suggesting that this is perfect, but if you're going to buy one, uh, at least start there and take a look at it, because you want to make sure that you get, I'm also, Hugen decided to do a bigger screen and then add a few more things to it, but the main thing he did is he took it from 300 to 900 megahertz. Okay, so he thought, okay, that would be the, the big step. Well, that was still on the small screen. So everybody bought that one, basically. That's the one I bought. Okay. Most of the ones you see were that model. He's since taken it to a larger screen, but is the larger screen worth 20 or 30 or 40 bucks? That's what it does to the price. So the answer is it's up to you. Okay. But the interesting thing is there's a lot of designs out there, and my suggestion is uh, Alibaba's got some, some issues with regard to how you pay for it and <coughs> PayPal versus this versus that. If you order from China, you know some of the details uh, of what's going on. But uh, at least you got the right, you're right, desi right design. Uh, I, I bought Amazon just so I'd have Amazon in front of me and not have to deal with you know, somebody who said, uh, it's broken, I'm sorry. So that, that's a suggestion, the starting point. Yeah. You said earlier what to look for to be sure you don't get a crappy one. What are the things to look for to make sure you don't get a crappy one? 
And if you type in to Amazon up there, what would you type in? Is Hogan 79 or a VNA or what would you type in to have found it? Another way to say that is I'm getting old and can't read that tiny print. <laughs> I can't read it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, me, let me tell you what happened with this. This slide, I'm, I'm a retired techie. I used to do PowerPoint presentations like most of you have here. And I'm now on a Mac. I've been on a Mac for 15 years and I'm never going back. Okay? And so I'm, I'm trying to do this presentation. I'm going, there's no PowerPoint on my Mac. What do I do? <laughs> so I had to use Keynote for the first time about four days ago. So I had to spin up on that, and so this slide got lost in translation between Keynote and PowerPoint on PC to get here. So that, that's why you can't read it. Well, okay. It's all Steve's fault. Okay. I just pushed the button. <laughs> Listen, so thank you for making the conversion, and we, we got through everything pretty well, I think. So, if you're looking on Amazon, what would you type in the search box? Uh, yeah. Well, you start with that, but you get 50,000. How do you know which so, one's a good so one? I, yeah, I went and DNA, looked up uh, this, uh, this device. Type in nano DNA, Hugen. Okay. H U G E N. Right, gotcha. And That's the best place to start. These devices have come up. All right, and what are the specs that you look for to be sure it's not crappy? You'd mentioned the special the the compound specs. You can't tell. You can't tell by reading the specs. That's the problem. What do you do to know which one to get? Well, buy, buy it from somewhere that you can send it back on, is the one thing. Use your Amex. Okay. It might cost you a few extra bucks. <laughs> use Amex. Okay, use Amex, get the Amex. Yeah. yeah. Um, in your pictures on your demo, you've got the USB port plugged in. Right. I just use it for power right now. Understood. If I'm up on a ladder out in the yard, and I'm taking readings on my G5 RV, right. and I want to come back and save them to my PC, assuming I've got the software, can I come back in and connect up to the computer and download the data out, or does the computer have to be plugged in before I start taking my readings? It will go to sleep without having turned the off switch to off. Yeah, you, you, you gotta, but it you got to have it fired up and have it talking to the device. So I've got to take my laptop out to the yard and make sure everything's connected before I do any readings. That, that, that's, you know, part of the reason I like doing it without the PC and didn't get into the software a whole lot, okay? And then the question is, would you like to have that capability in your ham shack and all you lose is the ability to go out there and do something outside? Because most guys are working with the antenna from the coax connector going in and the transceiver. They're not working on the, the battle out there. Yeah, but in my ham shack, the trans the coax from the antenna doesn't come directly into my shack. Okay. It goes to a switch, so. <laughs> but like I said, the device will run on its own. Yeah, and and when you turn it off, it's gone. That wasn't the question. No, I know. So we're, we're, we're at the time. We're out of time again. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Don't let it go. Hey, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to turn it off.